Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Unrivaled Investing. Just be warned, this is a no hype zone. We are purely focused on finding unrivaled investments. What's that mean? So today we are going to do a fundamental analysis, a deep dive on Oak Tree Acquisition Corp. They are a SPAC. They are merging with HIMS. You might be familiar with their brands, For HIMS or For Hers. It's kind of an interesting brand. What's their business model? What do their financials look like? Do they have an unrivaled value proposition? That is a key filter I use on every company I look at. It filters out like 95% of the investment universe because if you're unrivaled, it gives you the right to win. If you're not, you know, if you're not unrivaled, you're facing tough competition. Who knows how you, who, who knows what your outcome is like in the years ahead? What's the opportunity? Does this have 10x potential? I'm looking for stock. I'm looking for big game, baby. So in order to have a great return, you've got to have great fundamentals. You've got to have great growth. In order to have great growth, you got to have a huge market that you're tapping into, you know, 10x potential upside. Um, you know, I'm not looking for small moves here. I'm looking for multi-year, even multi-decade investments. And I'm thinking like, hey, how can I add value to you beyond just breaking down companies? I also offer a free investment calculator that you're going to see at the end of this video. But before digging in, if you like to learn about potential multi-backers, you know, companies that can potentially go up hundreds or even thousands of percent, make sure you subscribe to this channel. If you're already a subscriber, make sure you hit that like button. And if you want to know what I'm personally doing, what I'm buying, what am I selling, what am I holding, you can't take these shares away from me, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey, where you can follow my journey as I'm trying to find potential multi-baggers for my own portfolio. And remember, all it takes is potentially one multi-bagger to change your life journey. So also, one other point, if you like these videos, make sure to leave a comment where you're like, hey, you know, this is great, I learned a lot, I'd love for you to look at this company, and this is how I find a lot, this, this is, that's a lead for, for me in terms of where am I gonna make the next video, how am I gonna make it, it's based on your request, so please make sure to leave a comment below, and let's dig in. So Oak Tree Acquisition, ticker is OAC, it's a SPAC, they recently announced uh, who they're merging with, so it's a SPAC with $200 million pile of cash. That is generally what SPACs are. SPACs, you raise a bunch of cash, you're a cash holding company, and everyone's sort of generally issued at $10 a share, and people are like, hmm, will you find a deal? So the pros of a SPAC are that it's much easier and faster for companies to go public. It's also much easier for the companies to raise the money. They don't have to go through a rigorous IPO roadshow, where you have to have this detailed S1 that has all these risks, several hundred pages. Here you can make a nice presentation and you impress whoever's running the SPAC, boom, you can get the money as long as you know that you get the general votes to approve the SPAC uh, merger. The, the cons is that with fewer gatekeepers connecting you know, private companies effectively going public, it's much easier for crap to become public. I've done several videos on SPACs, so if you're interested in learning more, you can check them out. Like I did one on Hylion, I did one on Multiplan. You can check those out. Um, but who are we dealing with here with Oak Tree Acquisition Corp? I, you know, like it, it's worth understanding who the partners are. So first, Oak Tree, they are extremely shrewd and principled investors. You know, I've read Howard Marks's book. He's the founder of Oak Tree. Um, you know, their principal, they, they historically focused on distressed debt. Distressed debt, I would say, is like the one of the most complicated aspects of finance. Like you're you're looking at super you know, you have to read debt covenants. Anywho, that is probably one of the toughest areas in finance, and they've made their mark there. Um, prior investors in HIMS include Founders Fund. And when I saw that, I was just like, okay, now you really got my attention. Like Oak Tree, they're going in a SPAC, you know, they're going beyond their traditional bread and butter, which was distressed debt investing. You know, I'm not looking for distressed debts. I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for you know, these unrivaled in investments that can compound at a high rates so over long time, time periods. When I saw that Founders Fund was one of the earlier investments, like early investors, I was like, okay, now, now you've got my interest. Who is Founders Fund? So Founders Fund is, was founded by Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel, that should be a familiar name for you because pretty much he, he touches everything. Like his companies have touched everything. Like if you stayed in an Airbnb, if, you, if you're excited about a SpaceX rocket, if you've used a website that does e-commerce that's powered by Stripe, which you probably have. These are all companies that he's invested in, as long as plenty of others, you know, we 
Palantir is one of the companies he founded. Yes, Palantir is one, but PayPal is also another one. So it's like, yeah, he, he, his ability to see not where we are today, but where we are in 10 years from now, I think is just exceptional. So to hear that he was one of the early investors in hymns, it got my interest. And I'm like, okay, I want to understand what's the story here. And is this potentially an opportunity for me to partner at a fairly early stage? You know, like, look, he made he made a good chunk of his funds from being one of the first investors in Facebook. Um, and so here it is. The, the valuation of, of the hymns merger is going to be one to two billion dollars. So I'm thinking, wow, this is actually starting to get pretty interesting um, to me because like this is fairly early on in, in one of the ventures, you know, SpaceX is tens of billions of dollars valuation. So here it is, you know, one to two billion dollars. This is getting interesting. Like, let's look at the deal structure because, you know, I've, I've covered some SPACs, some of which didn't have the greatest deal structure. Let's look at So it's a very straightforward deal. You know, I recently did a video on CCXX, which is multi-plan. It was not straight at all. There's a lot of moving pieces. Here, it's very, very simple. You have $205 million from the SPAC, another $75 million from folks that Oak Tree knows and effectively friends that they know. So, you know, you're not looking at that much money. Um, you know, sub three hundred million dollars going into the company, and it's all going to the balance sheet, with the exception of thirty-five million dollars fees to the bankers. Because hey, the bankers got to get paid if you want this SPAC machine to keep going. Um, so that's that's how this works. Um, it's a pretty simple deal. Pump up the balance sheet with two hundred forty-five million in, in in cash, which is I like to see. You know, I, I like to see that effectively. No, none of the sellers are getting a payout. Um, so what's What's the business background like? Let's let's get into hymns and understand what 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 we're actually what's what's the product that we're going to be investing in because you know Oak OAC which is the ticker is just this cash pile that's merging with with hymns and hymns is going to be the key driver of whether or not you get good returns over time and so hymns is attempting to disrupt the primary care market and you could see how they 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 say. This is the new front door to healthcare where the patient is our consumer and the experience is frictionless. Nice words. We'll get to that in a second. But broadly, like what are the key points? Like one, it's super easy and timely to get a consult where you can get it within an hour versus if you try to see someone in person. Historically, it takes, you know, many days to get something on calendar because doctors are just booked like crazy. Um, the next is of co comprehensive and affordable care. Where they're saying, look, it's a primary care visit. That's that's like the initial gatekeeper for most for most medicine. Like you see your primary care doctor and they put point you in the direction. They can be the heat shield for most healthcare requests. But if you need a specialist, they'll point you in that direction. Here it is, primary care, thirty nine bucks. Insured, non insured, that's it. So that's that's pretty darn compelling because you can compare the average cost with insurance. You know, being 200 to 300 bucks, maybe with insurance, it's only 30, 40 bucks. So that, that depends on the copay. So they're, they're sort of removing the insurance aspect, which is a theme, you know, I've seen before where it's like, hey, can we get around sort of the, the crazy maze that is the insurance industry and just do a cash model where you get the access you need? Um, ubiquitous access, 24 seven care because, hey, this is telehealth. You're going online, going to the browser for hims or for hers.com. Um, or you're using their app. And also a key element here is that stigma free. They're saying like, look, you know, sometimes people feel uncomfortable seeing a doctor in person or having to go to a specific place if they're uncomfortable talking about something like, hey, I got herpes. No, like like that sort of thing. Like it, 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 you might feel a little more comfortable if, if you're doing it via telehealth. Um, you know, and, and also like, what about your sexuality? You know, things like that might be a little easier if you're talking to a doctor over the phone versus having to make a trip like who else is in this office when I go there you know you have these elements so pay an affordable telehealth checkup and get a prescription that's sort of the that seems like what the business model that they're talking about um and they're they also talk about personalized for you where they have you know they they built out the the electronic medical records so that way it's easy to log in and they're they're able to easily track you know what 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 are your what what are your what's your history you know, what, what symptoms you have and follow up with you. Um, but is this just a pipe dream or is this just a venture bed or is this actually a company that's getting traction? And it, whoa, the over 2 million cumulative telemedicine consults since 2018. That's incredible. Like they've in the first year, you know, they, they got to 430,000 
Then by 2019, they got to 1.2 million. And then by the second quarter, so by June 30th, 2020, they're at 2 million consoles. This was a company that's only been around for a couple of years, like not more than two, three years. To put this in perspective, Teladoc took 13 years to power 1 million medical console, consults. Him and hers powered over 1 million in their first year of op in first year of operations. So that's that is incredible growth. Um, let's uh, we'll want to fact check this or think about it, make sure it's realistic. But let's see what the user is looking at, like making sure this is realistic. And so you go to forhims.com. That's that's sort of you know look the ticker's hims. Uh, it will be hims when the merger completes. I think in all likelihood the merger will complete because. It's only you know two hundred million dollars. Oak Tree manages billions and billions. So like, honestly, you know, I know for for regular investors, like a couple million dollars that, that sounds like a lot, but for them, it's it's peanuts. So the deal, in my opinion, will very likely close. Um, so you know, the ticker starts off as OAC, but then it'll be hymns. But so what's what's interesting is is how they're not actually revolutionizing everything, but starting with primary care. With some common offshoots and you can see like here's a guy calling on the phone why they use like maybe they purposely like jokingly like let's have a guy sit in a bathrobe a nice pristine white bathrobe sitting on the can with a rotary phone maybe they're making a joke it just looks ridiculous to me um but you know there's they're, they're trying to say like hey and this is what you see when you go to the website like primary care this is where you can get that 39 dollars visit and then some common offshoots like hair, sex, skin, mental health, COVID-19, and supplements. So it seems like they're trying to tackle very specific paths. Like maybe it covers 50% of the primary care visits. Like primary care, once again, it's that heat shield. So that way, like, hey, can, can primary care handle a lot of the common requests, complaints, you know, ailments that you have so that you don't need to see a specialist? And so, you know, does this address 50%, 70%? I don't know, 30%, but it, it probably is a big market because you're, you know, hair, sex, skin. What's interesting about each of these things is one is they all have a high sensitivity factor where like, hey, if, if you're balding um, and you want to talk to a doctor about this, that might be something that you'd feel more comfortable doing in a telehealth visit. And it also is easily enabled with the telehealth. You know, you take your phone, Take a picture of your head. No need for a hair checkup for me. Thank you very much. But um, you know, the the these these categories of hair, sex, skin, um, mental health. These things, like it seems like they are tackling certain verticals that are both common as well as easily done through telehealth. So it's it's interesting to think about. And there's there's also potential stigmas involved. So that telehealth might have an advantage over in in person care. So how does the customer feel about this experience? And people are loving their prescriptions. Like people are loving the hims and hers experience. Like it's it's interesting to see. Like note what everyone is holding. Everyone's holding some sort of product, which which struck me as weird at first. We'll get into that in a minute because this actually has to do with the business model. But like if you're if you're talking about primary care and that's your value proposition, why is everyone holding something like this guy showing a picture of of him losing hair? And he's like, mm, I'm getting my hair back because of, you know, whatever, whatever he was prescribed. Um, but but the key point here is that 65 NPS an NPS score means net promoter score. So how likely is it that one of your customers, in this case, patients, is likely to verbally or you know, write you out a referral letter saying like, hey, I had a great time. And they're saying 65% of their patients, their clients, their customers are saying, yeah, I had a good experience. I will refer. I would recommend people use for him or for hers. That is huge, especially when they call out the traditional health providers have a nine. So that means the reason why this is so important is you effectively create this whole brand ambassadors where people like you so much, they start talking about you. And when they start talking about you, they're effectively marketing you without you having to spend that money. So when you have more and more people coming through your door without you saying anything, it lowers your cost from a business model perspective because you have more and more people come through the door and then maybe your ad spend is more effective. People are like, oh yeah, shoot, you know, like I 
Johnny's getting great results from his hair. And he was telling me, and he looks great. And like, now I'm seeing this ad on my computer for one of my other problems. And maybe I should click on, you know, for him. Maybe they can help me out, you know, in my bedroom life or something like that. Um, so that's, you know, you can see what, how, how this thought, how the, how the, how the value proposition of like, hey, having an incredible NPS score just can result in an incredible business model. Um, but can we fact check this? Like, do people actually love for hymns? And like, whoa, I went to the app store and they got 2.7 out of 5. I mean, that's a oh, reaction. I mean, they have terrible app reviews. Um, here's one review. I love the service. One star, keep in mind. I love the service and the company, but this app is simply terrible. They, they, they later talk about how the app functionality just works terribly, you know, sending updates sporadically. And I was reviewing these, like, you have a few fives and you have a lot of ones. And so that's why it's sort of going into 2.7. And so here, what's interesting is they please release a new app because I love your service and products and your website is great, but we live in a world of apps and you either have a great app or don't bother creating one for the sake of having it. Thank you. So when I'm seeing, and based on the complaints here, I'm, I'm assessing that their app just sucks. But if you go to their websites, this, the experience is seamless. Um, so that's that would be my take. If I were running the ship, I would remove the app from the app store like right now. Because this is a huge negative. Like, you don't want your first impression to be 2.7 stars especially for a medical health company. So like CEO, if you're watching this, I'd, I'd plug that up real quick. Um, also, you know, what's, what's kind of weird is they've only had 26 ratings. So either, you know, there's a couple possibilities. One is they're just not promoting the app at all because like for them to have 2 million consults cumulative since they've started and to only have 26 ratings on the app, it seems like either they're fabricating their console number, so it's possible like that two million number is just baloney. Like maybe they're maybe they're making up what the consults mean, or it's you know it's just a browser business. Like everyone's just going to forhims or forhers.com. So let's let's further fact check this. Like let's let's think about this. Like let's see. This is where you need to put on that thinking cap because you can't just always trust what management says. You got to think about like is this possible? Is this realistic? So from the end of 2019 through June 2020. Um, they had 800,000 consults, which is incredible. And they have 240 physicians that they use to, to, to work these consults. So 800,000 consults across six months is 4.4 thousand consults per day. And you have three shifts per day. Let's say each shift is eight hours. You know, three, three times eight is 24. So that means you have about one... 1, 1. 1.5 thousand consults per shift and you have 80 physicians per shift. Once again, I'm taking the 240, dividing it by three. This is approximate. Like you, you wouldn't actually staff it evenly throughout, you know, the three periods, but any, this is a 24 seven business. So you gotta, you gotta be prepared for, for night consults. Um, so 80, 80 physicians per shift. And so this approximately equates to 19 consults per shift, per eight hour shift per physician. So like that means that for each physician, they're doing like two to three consults per hour. And I'm thinking like, yeah, that checks out. Like that seems pretty reasonable to me. Like if you if you have a fleet of physicians, 240, and they're doing two to three an hour around the, you know, around the clock, 800,000 is definitely possible. So I, I, I'm going to say their figures check out, you know, it makes sense. Um, so, okay, they, they're trying to disrupt the primary care, but what's the business model? Like help me understand this. So the business model is acquiring new patients to go to their website, but they actually don't make the big bucks on primary care, which is like, what? Like, once again, they're using weird rotary phone and example, but this is what you see, like consult with a doctor for 39 bucks. But as far as I can tell, they get de minimis revenue from the $39 appointments. Maybe 100% goes to the physicians, which is interesting. Like, Maybe they're using an external fleet like what Amwell does. And I, I did a whole video on Amwell, ticker is AMWL. You should check it out. Um, but this strikes me as interesting. Like if they're not really getting any revenue from their primary care, like this, there's a potential of an unrivaled value proposition because anyone else 
anyone else that is trying to make money on on primary care where they're charging a premium for their doctors and then paying their doctors, they're going to have trouble versus competing with them if they're saying, hey, all the unit economics of this consult is going to the physician or most of it's going to this physician. Like that, that would strike me as you're, you have some sort of competitive advantage if your business model is tilted away from the primary care consult, and, and which is like, what? Like, I thought you were talking about prime, the, they're disrupting primary care. Like, what are you talking about? That's, that's what they're doing. How are they actually making money then? And it's not, if not primary care, then where? And you make it back on the prescription. And this is, this is like, you start, once again, that thinking cap is needed for this. Like, if you're, if let's say you have this external fleet of physicians that you train up, like, hey, this is what you need to do. You know, this, these are the steps we, we have. And, but if, if someone comes in with a problem for specialties we don't offer, here are the, here's the network of specialists that you should reach out to. But excluding that, if it's for a sexual problem, if it's for hair, if it's skin, we might be able to take care of it based on some prescriptions, like some generic treatments that we can provide with our own online pharmacy. Hmm. So like, for example, like, hey, for hymns, you know, the doctor says, you know, hey, primary care, you sound great. You know, maybe you get your lab done over here. But maybe what you probably need is to have some immunity boost. Like, let's just have some vitamin C gummy bears that you're going to eat. Literally, they're, they're shaped like gummy bears for $19. Um, and that's where they might be making their money. Like, hey, this is prescription-based money, prescription-based model where it's like, hey, yeah, you need this. We're going to give you a prescription. Let's create some recurring revenue. Maybe, maybe you buy the gummies on a subscription basis. Notice how subscribe is the first thing you see here versus one-time purchase. Seems pretty interesting to me. Um, it seems like a disruptive model that could continue to get market share. Um, if you're trying to compete heads up in primary care, telehealth without owning the profitable back half, which is let's say these prescriptions, you'll lose because they're effectively not competing on primary care. They're saying, hey, let's give the economics to the physicians. What we're interested in is yeah, for the occasional prescription you need to write, we would like to be that first call. We would like the physician, the, the physician when, when they're sizing up the patient saying, oh, you need this, let's get you a HIMSS or a HERS prescription. Um, this actually reminds me a lot of Roku. Um, I, I, I did a video on it. The reason why, ticker R-O-K-U, the reason why it reminds me of it is that like a lot of people think of Roku as this hardware device company. But the reality is almost all of their economics comes from the platform of people using Roku, which is you know, like huge percentages from ad revenue. And so what's interesting is like, what if it's the exact same idea? You, you do a low cost version to get people through the door. Use primary care as the gateway. And then once they're in, that's when you're getting these income streams of prescriptions that where you brand it using Hims or hers branding, and you're selling them, you know, hims, you know, gummy bears, vitamin C gummy bears, um, or things like that, or or hey, you know, you need this this hair treatment. We the doctors will send you, will will make sure you're getting the right prescription, or or hey, you know, it's for hers. You need birth control. We have 30 different options for you. You're you're getting this hers packet. Um, so let's. It's interesting because Roku uses. The hardware effectively is a step to get their foot in the door into a much greater market. Is that what they're doing here? Um, so let's let's go back into the OAC, the Oak Tree, or the His Hims um, market. Hims H I M S um, market. And so the business model is to monetize the prescriptions, um, where you know they say ninety one percent is online subscription. So people ninety one percent of their revenue is on a subscription basis. That's incredible. Um, you know, the rest 2% is the, the online non-subscription. So maybe you're doing a one-off purchase. So this is the vast majority of their business model is subscription, meaning we're recurring revenue. That's exciting. You know, you can see the detail. 83% is prescription. 10% is the non-prescription. So, you know, this is the, this is the gummy bears. This is the, Hey, you know, if, if I'm having some sort of sexual problem and I need to get my, you know, monthly lidocaine for my crotch or something, 
um, you know, hey, this this helps, and I'm gonna, I'm believe me, you know, performance in bed, that's gonna be important. So you, you're gonna, you're gonna be a lifetime subscriber to it. Um, and so, you know, that's that's what you see over here. But like, this is a key chart right here. Fifty-seven percent of their revenue is from sexual health, and the other thirty-five percent is from hair and derm, which is hair and skin. So, like, the vast majority of this business is prescriptions for sexual health and then for for skin and hair. And so like no wonder why the NPS score is so high. They're helping people where it counts. Like you you get you get my drift here, but like it's sexual health over here. That's nearly 60% of the business. Like if people feel like, "Hey, I'm I got that tingling sensation back again. I'm feeling good." You know, you no longer have to worry about your ED problems or something like. No wonder this is this has such a high NPS score, you know, net promoter score is because it costs so little. You didn't have much of it. There, there's no stigma because you're, you're doing this via telehealth. Um, you didn't have to go into an office where potentially, you know, other people are seeing you. Um, and then boom, you can get that prescription and it's sent to your door. You don't even have to go to the pharmacy and look at the pharmacist in their face and be like, yes, you know, the, that, that prescription's for me. Um, so, okay. So I've, I've sort of talked about like the revenue model, but like, once again, what's the business model? Like, help me understand the business model. And it's come for the primary care, stay for the birth control or the ED pills. Um, and you can see, like, this is this is the his for his for for, for him's, um, you know, the the sex, uh, you know, side when you click on that. And this is the, the for, for for her side. And you can see it's birth control. So like him's, it's erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, herpes, sexual health. Um, and then, then for hers, it's all about birth control, condoms, um, natural, all natural condoms, lubricant. So yes, recurring revenue, indeed, very, very sticky revenue. I get it. Um, like pe people need their stuff. I get it. Like, and it's, it's important stuff. Um, so do they have an unrivaled value proposition? Um, and you know, when I'm thinking about it, cause keep in mind, that's the filter I use to look at all companies. Um, so when I'm, when I'm thinking about like their, their value proposition, like first, uh, they have affordable primary care and that's a big deal. And, but, but keep in mind, it's, it's when you don't need a specialist, because this is like, Hey, the physicians should be directing you to one of these prescription areas. Presumably if it falls outside of that, Hey, maybe we point you in the direction of a specialist, in which case, like, was that 39 bucks worth it? I I'm in, I'm in the mindset, like 39 bucks versus the traditional model where you're going to wait several days, this is a huge improvement. It's both more affordable and timely. So I'm thinking, and and it, it deals with any sort of stigma issues, whether or not it's sexuality, location, you know, social aspects, um, demographics, like, hey, you know, may, maybe you live in a strongly, you know, Christian neighborhood, or you have a really strong Christian household, and, um, you know, they, they don't want you going off and getting birth control because what does that imply even though you need it? You know, the, those problems might be more easily addressed via telehealth app versus, you know, having to go to a CVS or a local pharmacy. Um, so I would say on the primary care side, which is not where they're making their money, their value proposition is really, really strong. Um, but what about their money making, their prescription business? And I would say this is a little trickier. You know, they're you're, the customer is effectively, you know, the, mer the, the, the client, the patient, they're effectively paying up for an off patent branded treatment. You know, they're, they're paying up for some, like here's, here's one form of birth control and you can see here's, you know, they're offering the for hers try today for $30. It's a pill. They have 10 different options are available. You know, you can see if you look it up on a competitor site, Trilo, Mar Marzia is the generic. This is the exact same thing. You know, here it is $30, but it comes in the HERS packaging and you got it through that primary care gateway because they're referring you to this. I mean, that that's ultimately the, the conflict of interest here is like the physician is going to recommend this site, HERS, because that's that there's a relationship there. But what if you could get it a cheaper prescription by going to a, you know, a site where you can get a free coupon and it the same generic will cost you, you know, less than half the price. Um, now there are some trade-offs here, like 
One is that you're able to get this way faster with the primary care. Um, two is that you're going to be getting it in the mail versus here, you know, you have to go to a store and get it, whether or not it's Costco, Ralph's or Safeway. Um, so I, I think it is like when you, when you're saying like, well, wait a second, this is still a lot more expensive than what you could get with, with these discounts. Um, I would still say like net, it's a win for the customer. It's a net, it's a win for the patient just because the ability and ease of getting care is just so important. And to be able to lower the cost, I mean, still, this is still like $30 for birth control. It's actually still lower than some brands. So I, you know, I would say like here, they're saying 37 retail, 35 retail, $125 retail at Safeway. So like, this is still, this is still a good deal. It's just not as, as good, you know, here at Unrivaled, I'm looking for great deals, but it's still, you know, it's still a good deal. Um, and it's still interesting. Uh, so you're, you're, you, you, you get it in the mail, which deals with the, you know, the, the social stressor stressors you might have any sort of stigma. Um, and it's a reasonable deal. It's not the best one that you can get. So it's, it's, it strikes me as, as very interesting from an, from an unrivaled value proposition perspective, like primary care, I'd say you probably are close to unrivaled for everything else, like the prescription, which is where they're making money. This is starting to get a little more challenged just because like, Hey, it's a brand. Like if, if people start trusting your brand, which they, it seems like they are with that 65 net promoter score, then you might have an unrivaled value proposition there as well, because why would someone, you know, go to, to Safeway and go get, you know, get, go get something in a, in a little bottle that doesn't look nearly as cool as this. So effectively you're paying, you know, 50% more for, for going through the hers or him's experience, which is interesting. What's the market potential with all of this? And it's huge, enormous. Uh, you know, this is, this is what management usually likes to do. Like, Hey, this is how much we have. And this is the potential. It's this huge potential. The reality is they probably do though. Like, like I'm thinking about it. Like if you can, you don't have to own all the specialties, but if you just, if you're just the markets where it's easy to diagnose and prescribe these things, where it's like, yeah, birth control, hair loss, anxiety, depression, primary care, derm, erectile dysfunction, like that's where they are today. And they're like, yeah, that's $350 billion in prescription market. Mic drop. $350 billion versus a couple hundred, you know, versus a hundred million dollar plus in revenue in 2020. So, you know, that's, that speaks to like, yeah, there's a lot of potential here. Um, and, and keep in mind, like they're saying like the future, they're going to be in sleep, fertility, men in the, you know, in the way future, cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes control, menopause. And the reality is this doesn't even include international. So, so like one 10 X potential check, like if you're at a hundred million in revenue, hundred to 200 million in revenue, and you're, you're saying your market's 300 billion plus, you know, Yes, you can definitely 10x from here fairly easily. And I could see how it gets disrupted because the ease of just paying 39 bucks for a primary care visit to deal with one of these problems. Like if 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 for hims or for hers can get the mind share of like, yeah, I have these problems, I can just go to that website and get it solved versus going through the maze of an insurance process, like then they could really start crushing it. Um yeah. So what, what about their financials? Like I, I've talked about their market potential. I've talked about their business model. Like what about their financials and their financials are actually really attractive, really attractive unit economics where, you know, like each year, the cohort, the prior years, customers that were acquired, you know, they start spending more and more than prior, than, 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 than prior years. So for example, the second quarter 2020 cohort, Within the first couple of months, they're spending $150 cumulative since they started. Whereas you can see the first half 2019, you know, it's much lower. You know, it's only by month two, it's only, you know, around 50 bucks versus like 150 bucks. So like they're doing something right here. Um, and it's it's interesting to see like the cost of acquisition for acquiring these customers is dropping. So they're saying it costs only $110 in the second quarter to acquire a customer. So they're saying out of 8 million, you know, in, in marketing spend, it only costs $110 per new patient or per new customer that's getting the prescription. And the reason why that's interesting is if you're looking at cohorts like this, 
where by month 12, you're spending at least $200. Well, if you've spent at least cumulative $200, well, their margins on their prescriptions, because their consolidated margins is around 70% plus, that means their gross profit has been around $140. This is, you know, versus, you know, in, in 2019, the total cost of acquiring, you know, the, the, the average cost of acquiring new customers was 153. So within a year, within a year, they're effectively paying that back with their gross profit dollar. Like that, that strikes me as pretty interesting, but it does mean that you want to find these things that have a multi-year relationship. Like, hey, you don't need birth control just for a couple of months. You're probably going to need it for years. And that's where they're saying the strong unit economics where you're getting a 3x payback. So you spend $153, now $110 um, to acquire a customer. And over the lifetime of that customer, you're getting $330 back. And so that that is very compelling because when you see something like that, then you're like, yes, Let's push, you know, pedal to the metal to acquire more and more. So that way you can get, you know, more revenue coming in because, hey, we know that they're going to pay for themselves over time. Now, what's really attractive is not only that people are spending more, so the newer customers are spending, more, but that the fact that they can spend less to acquire a new person, usually that cost of acquisition goes up. You know, if you think about your, you know, you're, you're spending money on, on search engine optimization on Google and more people are bidding on the same keywords, generally it goes up. Why is it going down? And I wonder if this has to do with the net promoter score where people are spreading the good word, you know, websites are saying, yes, you can trust for hims or for hers. And because of that, what you're gonna see is that the effectiveness of advertising is improving. So you see an ad and you're more likely to click on it. So you only need to see one ad versus three ads, in which case the cost of customer acquisition drops. So that's that's super interesting to see. What about their consolidated financials? This is their unit economics. What about their consolidated financials? And their financials are pretty darn compelling. Like from 2018 to 2019, they grew 209%. Their gross margin has gone from 29% to 54%. They're penciling out over 70% in 2020. Um, you know, over, you know, 75% in the next two years. And their losses really aren't that bad what they're penciling out. Like this means that cumulative in the next two years, they might lose $40 million, $50 million at most, you know, versus a capital raise, a cash raise of, you know, like $300 million. So, you know, they're going to have balance sheet to probably support this business. You, you probably won't need another capital raise after this. I can't say that with confidence with a lot of other SPACs out there that have just losses, you know, as far as the eye can see. And so, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see, you know, one of the concerns is why is the growth rate decelerating so much? This is something that management, in my opinion, didn't discuss real well. They had a transcript. And I don't think they touched upon it real well, where growth is going from 209% to 60, 67% forecast for 2020. Either they're just lowballing it, which is very possible. Like maybe they're just sandbagging the figures, which is possible. Um, or, because it seems really weird to say 67 and then another huge drop to 30%. Now they, they say like, Hey, this is a conservative estimate. This doesn't factor in the new, you know, prescriptions that we're going to be offering in the future. Um, you know, the new, the new categories that visit primary care physicians can effectively refer or write prescriptions for that will be covered by for hims or for hers. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it really makes me wonder if they're just trying to sandbag or lower their, their guidance. I don't understand why this drops so much. Like, it seems pretty low. Maybe it has to do with COVID, where, like, people are less likely to need a prescription for their hair. I, 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 it's confusing. I, it seems like sandbagging would be my guess. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's also interesting, like, with a 70% with a gross margin, you know, and negative... 20 million in EBITDA, that implies that they're investing 120 million between their gross profit and EBITDA. It's not like they're really developing new treatments. You know, the R&D budget should be fairly low. They're just rebranding these things. Like, okay, I can understand, you know, you have to develop the website. Apparently your, your development on the app sort of was a poor investment. Um, but like maybe the website just needs to be, you know, maintained. But I, I'm just thinking like, wow, it would be nice to know what the detail is that sort of walks you from this gross profit to this EBITDA level. 
because clearly they're going to invest a lot in sales and marketing. And that makes sense because the business model is bring, bring as many consults as you can to primary care. Primary care then directs you to this much more profitable. Primary care is going to be this hyper competitive space where anyone can, can you know, get doctors that are effectively competing against each other. They're going to optimize like, hey, we're going to pay the doctors this. And they're going to get all the economics or nearly all of the economics, but we're going to make the money on the prescriptions. Um, so like what I, I get the business model put, you know, get, get as much growth to do consults, to do the primary care that'll refer you to these prescriptions. But like, how much do they actually need to invest in sales and marketing long term? These are some of the questions I'm thinking about. There are actually a lot of other questions that, that get raised from this business model that are worth sort of just highlighting. Like one is the relationship aspect. Like, if they don't make money on their physicians, like what's the relationship there? Like what, what is the actual unit economics for their physicians? Like, do they, do they get some sort of cut on it? I'd love, I'd love to understand that in greater detail with the prescription aspect. Like how do you handle sort of the perverse incentives of a business model based on prescriptions where the physician sort of is encouraged to write a prescription? Like, does that create a perverse incentive to write a prescription where a patient may or may not have needed it? Or it may have been more affordable to go to a different website versus getting a for amps or for her brand. Next is like they, they talk about recurring revenue is 91% recurring, but they say their month multi-monthly orders are only 17%. I'd love just to see how those two figures jive. Um, these are all things that I, I expect would get flushed out in the months ahead, you know, as it becomes as you know, HIMS becomes this public company and it's no longer this this SPAC vehicle, you know, the Oak Tree SPAC vehicle. And then lastly, like uh, the question of shipping and addressing the immediate need, you know, are they, are they at a disadvantage for those that need or want, you know, their products then and there? You know, and I'm thinking back to the classic Netflix DVD versus Blockbuster debate. Clearly, there was a market for the Netflix DVD, even though you didn't get it then and there, but it was more affordable and you didn't have these late fees. So I'm just wondering, like, do you have the same dynamic here where you're not getting that skincare you know, cream that you really, you know, this acne is really bothering me right now. I need to get this cream. Like, is there a market where they're like, you know what, shoot, I'll, 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 I'll just get a subscription and it'll take care of what I need. And, you know, it might be a couple of days because it's effectively an online pharmacy. Um, you know, so maybe, maybe, you know, clearly Netflix DVDs actually did work for a long time before they pivoted to streaming. Um, but that's, uh, it's just something to wonder, like, will they be at a disadvantage because of that? So clearly, there are a lot of questions about the business model. What about the valuation? And keep in mind, this is my value proposition to you, my loyal YouTube subscribers, where I provide this very sheet for you to play around with. This is a hypothetical range. You know, if you think, Daniel, your assumptions are just fooey booey. I'm going to change them myself. I'm going to say this is what I think they should be. Do it. I encourage you to do it. Um, you can download the sheet, play around with it however you like, but this is a back of the envelope to show what sort of a hypothetical range that HIMSS could look at, which is currently OAC, but it will be HIMSS in the future. What 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 is the valuation range that you could be looking at? And so, you know, what, what we're looking at, you know, it's around 1050, which is around 2 billion market cap. Keep in mind, there's 300 million in cash, so it's actually lower. You know, they're growing based on their guidance. You know, they're saying they're doing around 67. So I, you know, I'm penciling out 60 versus 70. What are their margins? And this is this is a trickier question. Like you, you could say, Daniel, you are way too high on this 70% gross margin. Maybe, maybe their the gross margin only flows to 20% optimized margin or only 10%. I'm taking a guess of 25 to 30%. I'm doing an exclusive video just for journey followers where they can see my thought processes on optimized margins and how do I pencil out these things. I'll be dropping that later today. But if, if you become a journey subscriber, you'll be able to see my thoughts on optimized margins. I also talk specifically about this one in, in greater detail about the 25 to 30%. Um, but also like, so, so you have this growth rate, this revenue, this optimized margin. They're not going to be at this margin this year. They're losing money because they're investing a lot in sales and marketing to put people through their funnel of primary care visits. Um, but you can see like, hey, this implies 60 to 80 times earnings, you know, based on this optimized margin and slapping on a 25% tax rate. Um, so you can see 60 to 80 times their growth rate. You know, what, what could that be in the years ahead? Recently, it's been, you know, above 60%. Last year was 200%, but they're only modeling out 30% in the years ahead. 
in my base case, I'm saying 35% because I I'm saying, look, you're you're potentially low back, you know, you're potentially low balling it. Um, you know, it's the 25, 35, 50. Look, you can you can change this however you like, but my view is if you have an unrivaled value proposition with the primary care space and you've crushed it on the number of consults, what's they have? Like how many companies can grow to two million consults in like one to two years? That's incredible. So that that would make me think their growth rate might just have legs. And this this might be on the low end of things. Um, and so you can see, like, let's let's think about this over five years. And that's that's the whole point is I'm a long term investor. I'm thinking in years, decades. I'm not looking for week to week. I'm looking for unrivaled value proposition that's going to hold for years. That's how you make the big money, baby. And so here it is looking at this growth rate, thinking about it like, hey, let's assume the revenue is 25 percent or 50 percent per year over the next five years. That would get you to a billion dollars in revenue 2025. Um, based on the same margin profile that we have here, that's 300 million in, in optimized profits or theoretical profits and net profits of like 200 million slap on, you know, assumed multiple, that's even more, you know, art than science. That's even more art than the optimized margin calculation. You know, I'm, I'm doing a, a range of 20 to 30 times, you know, I, I'm still thinking about a lot of this stuff too. So, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, you know, so 20 to 30 times for this. And you can see the downside here in the low case is down. You're down five in five years from now. You've lost 25% of your investment. Not great. But the flip side is this does have like the Peter Thiel type of company potential of just like you own this amazing space. Like now you own, you know, you own part of a company that's dominating putting satellites into space like SpaceX. And like there's a potential that you have. This is a multi-bagger in the next five years. Potentially the next year or two. Like there, this is a very interesting range of outcomes. There's, I think, as a shareholder, you need greater clarity on several components of the business model. Um, their margin potential, like, it would be great if management actually called out, like, "Hey, this is what we think it could be." Um, but it's, you know, like relative to a lot of other videos I've done, and I recommend you check out some of them. Like some of the calculators I do, like it's the high side is like you lose five. So to see something where it's like, yeah, you could potentially make a couple hundred percent here. And the downside, like this, this is proposing like 10 to one, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I, I'm still honestly at this point, at this very point, I'm still thinking everything through. There's a lot to digest here, but it, it is an interesting setup. Um, you know, if, if you want to know what I what I end up doing, uh, you're going to have to go to unrivaledinvesting.com. Click on journey where you can see what I buy, what I sell, what I hold with monthly updates. I have exclusive content each week just for you, loyal Journey subscribers. And also just you know, a reminder, I truly in my heart of hearts believe all it takes is finding one potential multi-bagger to change your personal life journey. And so if you're interested in trying to find those potential multi-baggers, I'm trying to make it easier for you because that's what my journey is all about. I am trying to do that without my own personal you know, each investment, I'm thinking through this lens, is this company a potential multi-bagger? So if you're interested in following my journey, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe. If you're already a subscriber, please hit that thumbs up button. Thanks so much for watching.